Hello everybody and welcome to another edition of Physiology Made Easy with me, Dr. Amir Sandhu. Now in today's episode, we're going to focus on anaerobic threshold and I'm going to present to you a brief history of this concept. Now I do have videos, perhaps my most popular videos are actually on the anaerobic threshold uh, and based on those videos going up a couple of years ago, I actually got approached by the American College of Sports Medicine uh, to, and they commissioned an article which I wrote, we can see on the camera there, um, and I wrote this article, which was going to basically provide a state-of-the-art perspective on anaerobic threshold, what the concept is, how it can actually be used for improving endurance performance, uh, and what the physiological basis is. And essentially what I want to do today is to bring out the information that's in the article uh, into a video so that it can benefit as many coaches, practitioners, and athletes as possible. Now, with, with the, in terms of the article, um, I'm actually going to uh, provide the link to that article in the description to this video. Uh, and then what we'll basically do is get straight into it and start talking about the main concepts. Now, one thing that I didn't mention in my original video was how the anaerobic threshold actually came to be. So the anaerobic threshold concept has actually been around for a very long time. It was in 1964 when Wasserman and McIlroy uh, actually developed the protocol in cardiac patients. So basically what they w actually did was to understand more at, w at the basically understand more about how the anaerobic metabolism starts to dominate energy production uh, and obviously when you have anaerobic metabolism you start to produce large amounts of lactate and CO2 uh, and of course that's going to lead to fatigue very quickly. So they were able to uh, conduct uh, these experiments in cardiac patients and they were able to use ventilatory data to predict uh, when the anaerobic threshold occurs. And this was quite important because what it meant was that uh, submaximal exercise protocols and by submaximal we mean any exercise intensity which is uh, not to the maximum uh, so it's you know it's way below what you're maximally capable of doing so submaximal exercise protocols uh, could be developed in the clinical populations uh, and that would actually mean that uh, the patients could actually exercise for quite long periods so you know anywhere up to 60 minutes uh, at a intensity which was just below the uh, anaerobic threshold meaning they wouldn't accumulate any fatigue uh, and and they'd actually get the aerobic adaptations that occur when you do that type of exercise so in the early 60s it was ventilatory data that was actually being used to predict uh, or determine anaerobic threshold but later in the 1960s uh, we started we had the advent of capillary blood lactate and that kind of changed everything because it meant that we could actually uh, collect blood samples very easily and we can actually look at lactate levels as well and this is where lactate the lactate threshold came in uh, was introduced and in a way reflects similarly the processes that are occurring at the anaerobic threshold so essentially when you transition from aerobic energy sources to anaerobic energy sources we start to produce more lactate uh, and of course that lactate accumulation can be measured from the capillary blood lactate analysis uh, and we can actually then determine uh, at which point the person the individual is actually using anaerobic energy sources so that in, in, in essence paved the way for what would actually be useful for athletes as well uh, in order to improve endurance performance so when we talk about endurance performance quite a lot of people get confused between anaerobic threshold and the vo2 max now the vo2 max is basically think of it as like the size of the the engine of the car so it's the kind of maximum capacity that you have uh, it is a good measure of uh, uh, endurance fitness uh, an overall aerobic capacity uh, and it can actually be used to categorize individuals into uh, age and gender kind of and uh, normal uh, ranges as well um, however one of the limits limitations of VO2 max testing is it's got decreased sensitivity uh, to determining differences in endurance especially in highly trained athletes so if you've got uh, uh, athletes you basically have um, you know a VO2 max that's performed in two highly trained athletes and it will kind of give you a high overall value but it won't be able to pinpoint exactly uh, how when they how sorry it won't be able to co uh, pinpoint the capacity of their aerobic uh, energy system to produce continue to produce uh, ATP which is the energy source re relying on re that our muscles rely on to to function now now, 
the anaerobic threshold on the other hand is is very specific so when you're doing when you're utilizing submaximal exercise protocols for measuring anaerobic threshold or ventilatory threshold or lactate threshold um, then you're essentially able to pinpoint the exact point the exact speed on a treadmill or a power on a cycle ergometer or whatever form of exercise you're doing you're able to pinpoint the exact point at which you start to accumulate um, you know lactate co2 hydrogen ions which all lead to fatigue and then you can actually in terms of your training go for periods above that point so you know what that point is on on a you know in terms of treadmill speed for example you can train higher higher than that point for certain periods to elicit uh, adaptations to occur uh, but also in terms of trying to maintain for example a race pace in a marathon if you know that your anaerobic threshold occurs at a certain speed then you're actually able to just modulate your speed during uh, the run to keep it below uh, the point at which the anaerobic threshold occurs and that means that you can work in that aerobic zone for as long as possible. Now, you would have seen through this presentation so far that I've been using quite a number of different terms interchangeably. So I've been using anaerobic threshold, lactate threshold. Um, I haven't yet used um, gas exchange threshold. There's also the respiratory compensation threshold. There's also the onset of blood lactate accumulation uh, as well, which is usually set to four millimoles per liter of lactate. Um, we've got lactate minimum. Um, and so often these, these terms are often used interchangeably uh, to describe anaerobic metabolism or anaerobic threshold. Now, the reason why these terms have actually come about is because different modes of exercise have been used by scientists to try and uh, and to try and determine the anaerobic threshold. And by using different modes of exercise or different protocols, you often come out with different terminology. Now, the danger is that coaches um, and athletes, as well practitioners, uh, often use those terms interchangeably to mean the same thing. And what I'm going to do now is actually put a table ball up onto the screen to basically uh, give you just an overview of some of these different terms and how their definition is actually quite different to each other. So when we think about um, the anaerobic threshold concepts, we've got lactate threshold that we start with. Uh, and essentially, the, what we're looking at with the lactate threshold is the stage, the exercise stage where we start to get a very increased amount or significant amount of uh, uh, lactate being produced in the, um, the muscle. Uh, and we have this kind of exponential rise okay now different criteria can actually be used to um define what is a significant increase uh, but essentially it's the stage where you start to get a, you know kind of an exponential rise in your lactate now we also have the maximum lactate steady state and and that's essentially the um, stage before you get that exponential increase in lactate um, and it's where you actually get this balanced production of lactate, which is balanced with actually the clearance as well. So the whole thing with lactate is we produce it, but then we also have to, uh, and it starts to accumulate. But if we get, if we manage to get rid of that lactate, then we ma match the the kind of uh, production. Uh, with the removal and then we have this kind of steady state of uh, lactate production so that is quite important as well um, so that's the maximum lactate steady state that optimal balance between lactate we also have onset of blood lactate ac accumulation often just uh, called obla uh, and this is usually for a specific amount so basically once uh, you get to four millimoles uh, uh, per liter of lactate uh, when you're doing an incremental exercise test so you know you're you're ramping up the intensity stage by stage then essentially um, th it's thought that four millimoles is kind of like a critical value or threshold where we start to transition into anaerobic uh, energy sources now the next set of definitions are related more to what's happening in uh, our with our respiratory system with our ventilation okay so we have the ventilatory threshold one uh, and this is uh, sometimes just called ventilatory threshold now this is the intensity of exercise at which the ventilation will start to increase disproportionately to oxygen consumption Okay, so normally when we're doing, when we're increasing our exercise intensity, so we start to go for a jog, we start to um, increase our ventilation to, to get oxygen to the muscles um, to produce uh, the ATP, etc. Now, when we start to increase the intensity, then essentially we start to, at some point, when we shift over from aerobic to anaerobic energy sources, we start to produce more CO2. When that CO2 increases uh, to kind of like a critical level, our ventilation 
population starts changing and it becomes instead of matching oxygen consumption it becomes disproportionate to that and starts actually focusing on breathing out the excess amount of carbon dioxide that is produced and of course these are the mechanisms that i talk uh, at great length at in my previous videos so that's what's happening uh, in ventilatory, uh, ventilatory threshold one. And it's kind of reflecting that kind of movement towards anaerobic glycolysis. Now, we do have a, 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 a point called the respiratory compensation point, And this is also known as ventilatory threshold two. So when we look in the table, we can actually see that this is when you have during exercise a period where we're actually hyperventilating. And this is usually when we're doing very intense exercise. So it might be a hill sprint or increasing your running speed um, or you know the movement that you're doing is increased quite rapidly uh, and essentially what's happening here is you're having an we're having um, some various physiological factors at play one of them is the bicarbonate buffering system uh, and of course I do talk about the bicarbonate buffering system in great detail in the video on cardio, cardio carbon dioxide uh, responses uh, in in response to exercise so that video is worth checking out all of the links will be in the description of uh, this video so in respiratory compensation point or ventilatory threshold two we're essentially having bicarbonate buffering we're having an increase by that time in core body temperature as well activation of metaboreceptors mechanoreceptors and all of these are sending sensory signals to the respiratory center in the medulla oblongata uh, and it's that respiratory center which is then working on our ventilatory muscles uh, and stimulating ventilation uh, to be uh, quite high and the idea is to try and uh, remove as much carbon dioxide as possible to stop it building up <clears throat> Now, there is uh, another uh, term that's quite important, and this is called isocapnic buffering. Now, isocapnic buffering occurs between ventilatory threshold one and, and two. Okay, so it's that period in between ventilatory threshold one and two. And it's essentially reflecting a balanced production um, of, or sorry, balanced removal of CO2 by the bicarbonate buffering system. So essentially what you're trying to do in this stage is prevent <clears throat> CO2 and hydrogen from accumulating, which would cause acidity in the muscle. When we get acidity in the muscle, essentially what's happening is the enzymes will stop working uh, and will start to get fatigue and the, and, and the muscle will stop working as well. So uh, the isocapnic buffering phase is quite important because this is the um, measure of performance of in that aerobic to anaerobic zone and this is a point this is if you can stay in this isocapnic buffering phase um this is ideally what you want you want this kind of um you know you want anaerobic energy sources to be producing co2 and lactate and be producing the energy that you actually need you're obviously going to be running faster or you're exercising more intensely but you want your physiological mechanisms to be adapted to be able to remove the co2 the hydrogen and the lactate so that they don't build up you don't get fatigue and you can continue to work at a high pace.